Yo, what up? This is Chapter 14, Medical Emergencies, so let's get started. As an emergency medical responder, you could someday face a situation involving an unidentifiable medical emergency. Therefore, you may feel uncertain about how to provide care. When you face an emergency that is unclear, it is normal to feel indecisive. Yet, like any EMR, you will still want to provide care to the best of your ability. You do not have to diagnose or choose among possible problems to provide appropriate care. By following a few basic guidelines for care, you can provide appropriate care until more advanced medical personnel arrive. Because you know these guidelines for care, you can approach any medical emergency with confidence. Medical emergencies can develop rapidly or gradually and may persist for a very long time. Sometimes there are no warning signs or symptoms to alert you or the patient that something is about to happen. At other times, the only symptoms the patient complains of are feeling ill or a feeling that something is wrong. Symptoms may also be atypical. Older adults or those with diabetes, for example, may have a heart attack without experiencing chest pain. Medical emergencies have a wide range of causes, including chronic problems from diseases such as heart disease and diabetes, allergies, seizures from illnesses such as epilepsy or overexposure to heat or cold. There can be a variety of signs and symptoms, including sudden, unexplained, altered mental status. A patient may uh, complain of feeling lightheaded, dizzy, or weak, or the patient may feel nauseated or may vomit. Breathing, pulse, and skin characteristics may change. Ultimately, if a person looks and feels ill, there could be a medical emergency that requires immediate care. General Medical Complaints Making the Assessment and Providing Care The assessment and care of general medical complaints follow the same guidelines. Size up the scene to ensure your own safety and the safety of others. Conduct your primary assessment to identify and correct any immediately life-threatening conditions. Conduct a sample history and secondary assessment to gather additional information whenever possible. Summon more advanced medical personnel. Help the patient rest comfortably. Keep the patient from getting chilled or overheated. Provide reassurance. Prevent further harm and administer emergency oxygen if it's available and indicated. Altered mental status can result from many causes. Some of these include the following. Fever, infection, poisoning or overdose, including substance abuse or misuse, blood sugar or endocrine emergencies, head injuries, inadequate oxygenation or ventilation, any condition resulting in decreased blood flow or oxygen to the brain, cardiac emergencies, diabetic emergencies, shock, stroke, behavioral illness, or seizures. Altered mental status is one of the most common medical emergencies. It is often characterized by a sudden or gradual change in a person's level of consciousness, LOC, including drowsiness, confusion, or partial or complete loss of consciousness. Sometimes altered mental status is caused by a temporary reduction of blood flow to the brain, such as occurs when blood collects or pools in the legs or lower body. When the brain is suddenly deprived of its normal oxygen flow, it momentarily shuts down. This condition is called fainting or syncope. Fainting can be triggered by an emotional shock such as sight of blood. It may be caused by pain, specific medical conditions like heart disease, standing for a long time, or overexertion. Some people, such as pregnant women or the elderly, are more likely to faint when suddenly changing positions, for example, when moving from lying down to standing up. Whenever changes inside the body momentarily reduce the blood flow to the brain, fainting may occur. A person may faint with or without warning. Often, the person may feel lightheaded or dizzy. There may be signs of shock, such as pale or ashen, cool, moist skin. The person may feel nauseated and complain of numbness or tingling in the fingers and toes. The person's breathing and pulse may become faster. To care for patients with altered mental status, complete primary and secondary assessments and history is needed. Perform ongoing assessments as you provide care. Make sure the airway is open and place the unconscious patient in a supine position. Have suction equipment available if needed. If the patient is conscious or becomes conscious, do not give anything to eat or drink. Eating or drinking can increase the chance of vomiting. If possible, attempt to get information from the patient, family members, or bystanders. This is important, as a patient's condition may deteriorate rapidly in these situations, making conversation impossible. Any information you obtain may help with the patient's treatment upon arrival at the hospital. 
Sometimes a person may briefly faint and slowly begin to regain consciousness. Fainting often resolves itself when a patient moves from a standing to a sitting position or to a lying down position, as normal circulation to the brain often resumes. The patient usually regains consciousness within a minute. Fainting itself does not usually harm the patient, but injury may occur from falling. Take spinal precautions if trauma is suspected. If you can reach a person who is starting to collapse, lower the patient to the ground or another flat surface and position the patient on his or her back, lying flat. Monitor the patient's breathing and pulse. Loosen any restrictive clothing, such as a tie or a collar. Do not splash water on the patient's face. Doing so does little to stimulate the patient, and the patient can aspirate the water. Administrate emergency oxygen if it's available. Although a fainting patient usually recovers quickly, you may not be able to determine if fainting is associated with a more serious medical condition. For this reason, more advanced medical care is indicated and the EMS system should be activated. Pediatric considerations. Children who are experiencing altered mental status may exhibit a change in behavior, personality, or responsiveness beyond what is expected at their age. These children may exhibit anxiety, agitation, aggression, or combativeness. Alternately, they may be difficult to rouse, sleepy, or even unresponsive. It's not unusual for altered mental status to result in decreased muscle tone. Common causes of altered mental status requiring immediate medical attention include respiratory failure, deficiency in oxygen concentration in arterial blood, hypoxemia, shock, hypoglycemia, brain injury including shaken baby syndrome, seizures, poisoning, intentional overdose, sepsis, meningitis, hyperthermia, and hypothermia. Left untreated, altered mental status can lead to life-threatening problems including inefficient respiration, hypoxemia, airway obstruction, and respiratory failure. For care of children with altered mental status, take spinal precautions if the cause is not clear or if trauma is suspected. Treat any breathing emergency and care for any other injuries or conditions found. Obtain more advanced medical care and provide ongoing assessment and care. When the normal functions of the brain are disrupted by injury, disease, fever, infection, metabolic disturbances, or conditions causing a decreased oxygen level, a seizure may occur. The seizure is a result of abnormal electrical activity in the brain and causes temporary involuntary changes in body movement, function, sensation, awareness, or behavior. Today we'll discuss five types of seizures. Generalized seizures, partial seizures, absence, petite mal seizures, febrile seizures, and epilepsy. Generalized tonic-clonic seizures, also called grand mal seizures, are the most well-known type of seizure. They involve both hemispheres of the brain and usually result in loss of consciousness. The seizure activity is known as tonic-clonic, which refers to the initial rigidity, tonic phase, followed by the rhythmic muscle contractions, clonic phase, or convulsions. This type of seizure rarely lasts for more than a few minutes. Before a generalized seizure occurs, the patient may experience an unusual sensation or feeling, called an aura. An aura can include a strange sound, taste, smell, or an urgent need to get to safety. If the patient recognizes the aura, there may be time to warn bystanders, or to sit or lie down, before the seizure occurs. Generalized seizures usually last one to three minutes, and can produce a wide range of signs and symptoms. When a seizure occurs, the patient loses consciousness and can fall, causing injury. The patient may become rigid and then experience sudden, uncontrollable muscular contractions, known as convulsions, lasting several minutes. Breathing may become irregular and even stop temporarily. The patient may drool and the eyes may roll upward. As the seizure subsides and the muscles relax, the patient may have a loss of bladder or bowel control. The patient experiences sudden, uncontrollable muscle, muscular contractions, convulsions, lasting several minutes. The stages of most generalized seizures are as follows. Aura phase. Patient may sense something unusual. Not all patients will experience an aura. Tonic phase. Unconscious, then muscle rigidity. Clonic phase. Uncontrollable muscular contractions, also known as convulsions. Post-ictal phase. Diminished responsiveness with gradual recovery and confusion. Patient may feel confused and want to sleep. Partial seizures may be simple or complex. 
They usually involve only a very small area of one hemisphere of the brain. Partial seizures are the most common type of seizure experienced by people with epilepsy. Partial seizures can spread and become a generalized seizure. In simple partial seizures, the patient usually remains aware. Complex partial seizures usually last for one to two minutes, though they may last longer, and awareness is either impaired or lost while the patient remains conscious. With simple partial seizures, the patient usually remains aware, but someone experiencing a complex partial seizure experiences altered mental status or unresponsiveness. In simple partial seizures, there may be involuntary muscular contractions in one area of the body, for example the arm, leg, or face. Some people cannot speak or move during a simple partial seizure, although they may remember everything that occurred. Simple partial seizures may produce a feeling of fear or a sense that something bad is about to happen. Simple partial seizures can also produce odd sensations, such as strange smells or hearing voices. Rarely, feelings of anger and rage or joy and happiness can be brought on by the seizure. Auras are a form of simple partial seizure. Complex partial seizures often begin with a blank stare followed by random movements such as smacking the lips or chewing. The patient appears dazed, the movements are clumsy, and the patient's activities lack direction. They may be unable to follow directions or answer questions. This type of seizure usually lasts for only a few minutes, but it may last longer. The patient cannot remember what happened after the seizure is over and may be confused. This is called the post-ictal phase. Individuals may also experience an absent seizure, also known as a petite mal seizure. These are the most common in children. During an absent seizure, there is a brief, sudden loss of awareness or conscious activity. There may be minimal or no movement, and the person may appear to have a blank stare. Most often, these seizures will only last a few seconds. Absence seizures cause the person to experience loss of awareness for short periods that may be mistaken for daydreaming. This type of seizure may also be referred to as a non-convulsive seizure because the body remains relatively still during the episode, though eye fluttering and chewing movements may be seen. Young children and infants may be at risk for febrile seizures, which are seizures brought on by a rapid increase in body temperature. They are most common in children under the age of 5. Febrile seizures are often caused by ear, throat, or digestive system infections and are most likely to occur when a child or an infant runs a rectal temperature of over 102 degrees Fahrenheit. An individual experiencing a febrile seizure may experience some of or all of the following symptoms. Sudden rise in body temperature, change in level of consciousness, rhythmic jerking in the head and limbs, loss of bladder or bowel control, confusion, drowsiness, crying out, becoming rigid, holding the breath, rolling the eyes upward. Epilepsy is a common neurological disorder estimated to affect approximately 3 million people in the United States alone. Epilepsy is not a specific disease, but a term used to describe a group of disorders in which the individual experiences recurrent seizures as the main symptom. In about one-third of all cases, seizures occur as a result of a brain abnormality or neurological disorder, but in two-thirds, there is no known cause. The risk of having epilepsy for younger people up to the age of 20 is approximately 1%, with the greatest likelihood occurring during the first year of life. People aged 20 to 55 may also develop epilepsy, but have a somewhat lower risk. The risk increases again after the age of 65, and in fact the highest rate of new epilepsy diagnoses are in this age group. The prevalence of epilepsy, or the number of individuals suffering with it at any time, is estimated to be approximately 5 to 8 in every 1,000 people. By age 75, approximately 3% of people will have been diagnosed with epilepsy. People of any age can be affected by epilepsy. Patients who have epilepsy often can control the seizures with medication. Those with difficult-to-control seizures may also be treated with surgical resection, which can be curative or with implanted devices such as the vagus nerve stimulator that help reduce their seizure frequency. While some patients require lifelong medical therapy, sometimes medication may be reduced or even eliminated over time. Some childhood epilepsies may resolve with age. Seeing someone have a seizure may be intimidating, but you can easily care for the patient. 
The patient cannot control any muscular contractions that may occur, and it's important to allow the seizure to run its course, because attempting to stop it or restrain the patient can cause muscular skeletal injuries. Protecting the patient from injury and managing the airway are your priorities when caring for a patient having a seizure. To help avoid injury, you should move nearby objects, such as furniture, away from the patient. People having seizures rarely bite the tongue or cheeks with enough force to cause any significant bleeding. Do not place anything in the mouth to prevent this type of injury. Foreign bodies in the mouth cause airway obstruction. Do not put the fingers in the mouth of an actively seizing patient to clear the airway. After the seizure passes, position the patient on his or her side if possible so that fluids, saliva, blood vomit can drain from the mouth. In many cases, the seizure will be over by the time you arrive. In, the, in this case, the patient may be drowsy and disoriented. This is the post-ictal phase. Check to see if the patient was injured during the seizure. Offer comfort and reassurance, especially if the seizure occurred in public, as the patient may feel embarrassed and self-conscious. If this is the case, keep bystanders well back to provide maximum privacy and stay with the patient until he or she is fully conscious and aware of the surroundings. Care for a child or an infant who experiences a febrile seizure is similar to the care for any other patient experiencing a seizure. Immediately after a febrile seizure, cool the body by removing excess clothing and giving the patient a sponge bath in lukewarm water. Ensure the water is lukewarm. Cold water could lead to a rapid drop in body temperature which could cause shivering and or a cold stimulation of the nervous system which could bring on another seizure. Rapid cooling with cold water could bring on complications as well. Contact a healthcare provider before administering any medication such as acetaminophen to control fever. Do not give aspirin to a feverish child under 18 years of age or infant as it's been linked to Ray syndrome an illness that affects the brain and other internal organs. The patient will usually recover from a seizure in a few minutes. If you discover the patient has a medical history of seizures that is medically controlled, there may be no further need for medical attention. However, in the following cases, more advanced medical care should be provided. The seizure lasts for more than five minutes or the patient has repeated seizures with no sign of slowing down, known as status ellipticus. The patient appears to be injured. If you are uncertain about the cause of the seizure, if the patient is pregnant, if the patient is known to have diabetes, if the patient's a child or an infant, if the seizure takes place in water, if the patient fails to regain consciousness after the seizure, if the patient is a young child or an infant who experienced a febrile seizure brought on by a high fever, if the patient is elderly and could have suffered a stroke, or also call 911 if this is the patient's first seizure. Status ellipticus is an epileptic seizure or repeated seizures that last longer than five minutes without any sign of slowing down. A status epilepticus seizure is a true medical emergency that may be fatal. If you suspect the patient is experiencing this type of seizure, call for more advanced medical personnel immediately. If the seizure passes, place the patient on their side and suction if possible. If the patient is having difficulty breathing, administer ventilations with a BVM, bag valve mask resuscitator, along with emergency oxygen. Diabetes mellitus is one of the leading causes of death and disability in the United States today. As of 2005, 20.8 20 million Americans, 7% of our population, currently has diabetes, and 1.5 million new cases were diagnosed in people ages 20 years or older in 2005. It is estimated that another 6.2 million people with the disease are undiagnosed. Diabetes contributes to other conditions, including blindness, kidney disease, heart disease, periodontal disease, and stroke. Today, we'll define the terms of diabetes, high blood glucose, and low blood glucose. There are two major types of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, formerly known as insulin-dependent diabetes or juvenile diabetes, causes the body to produce little or no insulin. Most people who have type 1 diabetes have to inject insulin into their bodies daily. In type 2 diabetes, formerly known as non-insulin-dependent diabetes or adult-onset diabetes, the body produces insulin, but either the cells do not use the insulin efficiently or not enough insulin is produced. This type of diabetes is more common than type 1 diabetes. 
Most people with type 2 diabetes can regulate their blood glucose level, BGL, sufficiently enough through diet and sometimes through oral medications, without insulin injections. People with diabetes must carefully monitor their BGL, diet, and amount of exercise. People with diabetes must also regulate their use of insulin. When diet and exercise are not controlled, either of two problems can occur. Too much or too little sugar in the body. This imbalance of sugar and insulin in the blood causes illness. Some women develop diabetes in the late stages of pregnancy. This form usually goes away after the baby is born. This type is called gestational diabetes and is caused by hormones of pregnancy or a shortage of insulin. Women who have this condition have an increased likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. When the insulin level in the body is too low, the sugar level in the blood is high. This condition is called hyperglycemia. Sugar is present in the blood but cannot be transported from the blood into the cells without insulin, causing body cells to become starved for sugar. The body attempts to meet its need for energy by using other stored food and energy sources, such as fats. However, converting fat to energy is less efficient, produces waste products, and increases the acidity level in the blood, causing a condition known as diabetic ketoacidosis, DKA. As this occurs, the person becomes ill. The patient may have flushed, hot, dry skin, and a sweet breath odor that can be mistaken for the smell of alcohol. The patient may also appear restless or agitated, have abdominal pain, or be thirsty. If this condition is not treated promptly, diabetic coma, a life-threatening emergency in which very high blood sugar causes the patient to become unconscious, can occur. When the insulin level in the body is too high, the patient has a low sugar level known as hypoglycemia. The blood sugar level can become too low if the person with diabetes takes too much insulin, fails to eat adequately, over-exercises and burns off sugar faster than normal, or experiences great emotional stress. In this situation, the small amount of sugar is used up rapidly, so not enough sugar is available for the brain to function properly. If left untreated even for a short time, hypoglycemia from an insulin reaction can cause brain damage or death. Call for more advanced medical personnel immediately. This condition is also known as insulin shock. To function normally, body cells need sugar as an energy source. Through the digestive process, the body breaks down food into simple sugars, such as glucose, which are absorbed into the bloodstream. However, sugar cannot pass freely from the blood into body cells. Insulin, a hormone produced in the pancreas, is needed for sugar to pass into cells. Without a proper balance of sugar and insulin in the blood, the cells will starve and the body will not function properly. Maintaining normal blood glucose levels reduces the risk of eye, kidney, heart, and nerve problems. Many people with diabetes have blood glucose monitors that can be used to check their BGL at home. Many hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic episodes are now managed at home because of the rapid information these monitors provide. Although hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia are different conditions, the major signs and symptoms are similar. These include changes in the level of consciousness including dizziness, drowsiness, and confusion, irregular breathing, abnormal pulse whether it be rapid or weak, feeling and looking ill, and abnormal skin characteristics. To care for diabetic emergencies, first perform a primary assessment and care for any life-threatening conditions. If the patient is conscious, conduct a physical exam and sample history looking for anything visibly wrong. Ask if the patient has diabetes and look for a medical identification tag or bracelet. If the patient is known to have diabetes and exhibits the signs and symptoms previously stated, then suspect a diabetic emergency. If the conscious patient can take food or fluids, give sugar preferably in the form of glucose tablets. Glucose paste, milk, and most fruit juices, example given about 12 ounces of orange juice, and non-diet soft drinks have enough sugar to be effective. Common table sugar, either dry or dissolved in a glass of water, can restore the patient to a normal condition. Sometimes, patients with diabetes will be able to tell you what's wrong and will ask for something with sugar in it, 
If the patient's problem is low sugar hypoglycemia, the sugar you give will help quickly. If the patient already has too much sugar hyperglycemia, the excess sugar will do no further harm. Do not try to assist the patient by administering insulin. Only give something by mouth if the patient is fully conscious. If the patient is unconscious, monitor the patient's condition, keep the patient from getting chilled or overheated, summon more advanced medical personnel, and administer emergency oxygen if it's available. If the patient is conscious but does not feel better within approximately 5 minutes after taking sugar, summon more advanced medical personnel. A stroke, also called a cerebrovascular accident, CVA, or a brain attack, is a disruption of blood flow to a part of the brain, which may cause permanent damage to brain tissue if not appropriately treated within several hours. Most commonly, a stroke is caused by a blood clot called a thrombus or embolism that forms or lodges in the arteries supplying blood to the brain. Fat deposits lining an artery, atherosclerosis, may also cause a stroke known as an ischemic stroke. Another less common cause of stroke is bleeding from a ruptured artery in the brain. Known as a hemorrhagic stroke, this condition is brought on by high blood pressure or an aneurysm, a weak area in an artery wall that balloons out and can rupture. Less commonly, a tumor or swelling from a head injury may cause a stroke by compressing an artery. A transient ischemic attack, TIA, is often referred to as a mini-stroke. It is a temporary episode that, like a stroke, is caused by reduced blood flow to part of the brain. Unlike a stroke, the signs and symptoms of a TIA disappear within a few minutes or hours of its onset. If symptoms persist after 24 hours, the event is not considered a TIA, but a stroke. Although the indicators of TIA disappear quickly, the patient is not out of danger. In fact, someone who experiences a TIA has a nearly 10 time greater chance of having a stroke in the future than does someone who has not experienced a TIA. The risk factors for stroke and TIA are similar to those for heart disease. Some risk factors are beyond the patient's control, such as age, gender, or family history of a stroke, TIA, di diabetes, or heart disease. Others can be controlled, such as blood pressure, smoking, diet, and exercise. Stroke is common in the geriatric population. As with other sudden illnesses, looking or feeling ill or displaying abnormal behavior are common signs of a stroke or TIA. Other specific signs and symptoms of stroke come on suddenly, including weakness or numbness of the face, arm, or leg, often on one side of the body, facial droop or drooling, difficulty with speech, the patient may have trouble talking, getting words out, or being understood when speaking, and may have being trouble understanding. Loss of vision or disturbed, blurred or dim vision in one or both eyes. Pupils of the eyes may be of unequal size. Sudden severe headache, unexplained and often described as their worst headache ever. Dizziness, confusion, agitation, loss of consciousness, or other severe art altered mental status. Loss of balance or coordination, trouble walking or ringing in the ears, or incontinence. Two common stroke assessment scales used in the pre-hospital setting are the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale and the Los Angeles Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen, which assess facial droop, arm drift, and speech. Both scales should be included in your assessment of the stroke patient and reported to the medical facility. A Glasgow Coma Score, GCS, also should be obtained on the patient. Collecting and reporting this information will help ensure the required management of the stroke patient. The FAST mnemonic is based on the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Scale, which was originally developed for EMS workers in 1997. The scale was designed to help paramedics identify strokes in the field so that emergency rooms can be prepared before the paramedics arrive. The FAST method of public awareness has been in use in the community of Cincinnati, Ohio since 1999, and has since been used in several other variations of the message. It, is, it was validated by researchers at the University of North Carolina in 2003. FAST stands for the following. F is for face. Ask the person to smile. Does one side of their face droop? A is for arm. Ask the person to raise both arms. Does one arm drift downward? S is for speech. Ask the person to repeat a simple sentence. Are the words slurred? Can the person repeat the sentence correctly? T is for time. 
try to determine the onset of symptoms. If the person shows any signs or symptoms of stroke, time is critical. Immediate transport by more advanced medical personnel is necessary. If the patient is unconscious, ensure that the airway is open and care for any life-threatening conditions. If fluid or vomit is in the unresponsive patient's mouth, position the patient on one side to allow any fluids to drain out of the mouth. You may have to remove some fluids or vomit from the patient's mouth using a finger or suctioning equipment. Stay with the patient and monitor his or her condition. If the patient is conscious, check for non-life-threatening conditions. A stroke can make a patient fearful and anxious due to not understanding what has happened. Offer comfort and reassurance and have the patient rest in a comfortable position. Do not give anything to eat or drink. Although a stroke patient may find it difficult to speak, the patient may understand what you say. If the patient is unable to speak, you may have to use nonverbal forms of communication, such as hand squeezing or eye blinking, once for yes, twice for no, and communicate in ways that require a yes or no response. In the past, a stroke almost always caused irreversible brain damage. Today, new medications and medical procedures can limit or reduce the damage caused by a stroke. Many of these new treatments are time sensitive. Therefore, you should immediately call for more advanced medical personnel to get the best care for the patient. It is very important to interview the patient, family members, and bystanders to determine the time of onset of symptoms and to transport the patient to an appropriate receiving facility immediately. Abdominal pain is felt between the chest and groin, which is commonly referred to as the stomach region or belly. There are many organs in the abdomen, so when a patient is suffering from abdominal pain, it can originate from any one of them. These include digestive organs, such as the inferior end of the esophagus, stomach, small and large intestines, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, aorta, appendix, kidneys, and spleen. Abdominal emergencies can be life-threatening and require immediate care to prevent shock, so they should always be treated seriously. A sudden onset of abdominal pain is called acute abdomen. Abdominal pain can be difficult to pinpoint, as the pain may start from somewhere else and could be a result of any number of generalized infections, including the flu or strep throat. The intensity of the pain does not always reflect the seriousness of the condition. Severe abdominal pain can be from mild conditions, such as intestinal gas, whereas a relatively mild pain or no pain may be present with life-threatening conditions, such as early appendicitis. If you are called to a patient who is experiencing abdominal pain, assume the pain is serious, as the patient or family members were concerned enough to seek emergency medical attention. Patients suffering from abdominal pain may show the following signs and symptoms. Colicky pain or cramps that come in waves, abdominal tenderness, local or diffuse, Guarded position, anxiety, a reluctance to move for fear of pain, loss of appetite, nausea or vomiting, fever, rigid, tense or distended stomach, signs of shock, vomiting blood with a red or brownish appearance, blood in the stool appearing red or black, rapid pulse or blood pressure changes. When conducting an assessment, monitor the patient's movements. Take note if the patient is restless or quiet and if the patient feels pain when moving. Check to see if the abdomen is distended and, if possible, confirm with the patient whether the appearance of the stomach is normal. See if the patient is able to relax the abdomen and palpate the stomach to determine if it's rigid or soft. Examine the area the patient indicates as the location of the pain last. Do not overpalpate, as this can aggravate the condition as well as cause more pain. First, ensure the patient has an open airway. Call for transport to a medical facility. In the case of abdominal pain, it's important to watch for signs of potential aspiration due to vomiting. In cases in which the patient is experiencing nausea, place the patient on the side if it's not too painful. Do not give the patient food, water, or medication. Watch for signs of shock. If vital signs and other observations indicate that the patient is in shock, place the patient on their back, maintain normal body temperature, and administer emergency oxygen if available. Abdominal pain in children can indicate a vast range of conditions. A sudden and progressive onset of pain, excessive vomiting or diarrhea, blood noted in vomit or stool, abdominal distension, high blood sugar, ultra mental status, and abnormal vital signs are all signs that the child could be suffering 
from a serious condition or illness. Vomiting and diarrhea in children are significant symptoms as they may cause dehydration and shock. To assess a child complaining of abdominal pain, take the following steps. Obtain a first impression of the child's appearance, breathing and circulation to determine urgency. Evaluate the child's mental status, airway, adequacy of breathing, and circulation. Take the child's history and perform a hands-on physical examination, noting any injury, hemorrhage, discoloration, distension, rigidity, guarding, or tenderness within the four abdominal quadrants. If a life-threatening condition is noted, provide immediate treatment before continuing. Children of different ages tend to have different causes of pain. Causes in an infant can include colic, allergies to cow's milk, reflux esophagus, vulvalitis, which is bowel obstruction, or Hirschsprung's disease, congenital disease affecting the large intestine. In school-aged children, the most frequent cause of abdominal pain is gastroenteritis, or stomach flu, which may result in significant fluid loss. Also common is the ingestion of toxic substances or food poisoning. In adolescents, growth, development, and fertility issues can cause problems such as testicular torsion, twisting of the testicles, ovarian cysts, pelvic inflammatory disease, ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy that occurs outside the womb, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, DKA, pneumonia, and sickle cell anemia. Understanding that elderly patients may experience vague symptoms and have nonspecific findings on examination is important. Keep in mind that abdominal pain may actually be caused by a heart attack or other medical conditions. Many elderly patients may have much less severe pain than expected for a particular illness or disease, which can lead to elderly patients with serious conditions being misdiagnosed with less serious conditions, such as gastroenteritis or constipation. Vomiting and diarrhea are significant symptoms in geriatric patients as they can cause dehydration and shock. Causes of abdominal pain in elderly patients may include bilary tract disease, appendicitis, diverticulitis, mesenteric ischemia, bowel obstruction, abdominal aortic aneurysm, peptic ulcer disease, malignancy, and gastroenteritis. Many different conditions can cause abdominal pain, including inflammation of the appendix, bowel obstruction, inflammation of the gallbladder, abdominal aortic aneurysm, diverticular disease, shingles, food allergies, food poisoning, gastroenteritis, and others. Consider the situation an emergency when the abdominal pain restricts activity. People with advanced renal failure or kidney failure often need dialysis to filter waste products from their blood using a special filtering solution. There are two types of dialysis, peritoneal dialysis, which injects a solution through the abdominal wall and then withdraws it after a period of time, and hemodialysis, which uses a machine to clean waste products from the blood. Dialysis is often used on patients with renal disease while they are waiting for a kidney transplant. Complications of dialysis include hypotension, disequilibrium syndrome, hemorrhage, introduction of an air embolus or other foreign body into the patient's circulatory system due to equipment malfunction, and complication caused by temporary stopping a patient's medications during the dialysis process. The following details should be considered when taking a history and physical exam with a patient who has renal failure. A comprehensive history should include information about past dialysis and complications, recent salt, potassium, and fluid intake, information about the current dialysis session, and the patient's dry weight and how much fluid was removed before the session was terminated. The general physical assessment should include fluid status, mental status, cardiac rhythm, and shunt location. Take a note that shunts in the arm are common in long-term hemodialysis patients. If an active shunt is located on the patient's arm, do not take blood pressures using that arm. Old non-functional shunts are not uncommon, and blood pressures can be taken on an arm with a non-functional shunt. Ask the patient about active and non-functional shunt locations when taking their history. Shunts can also be potential sites of infection and or blockage. Pay attention for associated medical problems such as arrhythmias, internal bleeding, hypoglycemia, 
altered mental status, and seizures. Be aware that, after dialysis, patients may have hypovolemia, tachycardia, and hypotension. Delayed dialysis patients will have hypervolemia and may have abnormal lung sounds such as crackles, generalized edema, hypertension, or jugular venous distension. Be alert for altered mental status and also assess cardiac rhythm. Patients on dialysis can experience several types of complications, for example, uremia, fluid overload, anemia, hypertension, hyperkalemia, and coronary artery disease. Emergencies also can occur as complications of the dialysis itself, including hypotension, disequilibrium syndrome, hemorrhage, equipment malfunction, or complications from being temporarily removed from medications. As is true of all emergencies, a medical emergency can strike anyone at any time. The signs and symptoms for each of the medical emergencies described in this chapter, such as changes in level of consciousness, sweating, confusion, weakness, and appearing ill, will indicate the necessary initial care you should provide. In most cases involving a medical emergency, your biggest challenge is that you may not know the cause. In the case of a diabetic emergency, seizure, stroke, and fainting, the causes may be easier to ascertain. However, you can provide proper care without knowing the exact cause, allowing the patient to remain as comfortable and safe as possible until arrival at a medical facility. You can also recognize the dangers and complications of dealing with those with diabetes or renal failure. And you have learned the importance of age considerations in many conditions, such as abdominal pain and seizure. Performing a proper assessment and following the general guidelines of care for an emergency will help prevent the condition from becoming worse. While it is not your role to diagnose the problem, it is your job to provide the initial care to the patient until a proper diagnosis can be made. Enrichment for Chapter 14 is basic pharmacology. I want you to check out common forms of medication, basic medication terminology. I want you to check out drug names, drug profiles, how to prescribe information, routes of administration. Um, the rights of drug administration when we look at the administering medications overview. I want you to check out the administration of versus assistance with medication. Administration routes, reassessment, documentation, role of medical oversight and medical administration. I want you guys to look at how to administer aspirin. I want you to look at all the information for administering the drug, such as generic and trade names, indications, contraindications, actions, and side effects, expiration dates, dosage, and administrations. I want you to do all of those things for the following drugs along with aspirin. Also, administering nitroglycerin, administering oral glucose, and I also want you to check out how to test blood glucose levels with a blood glucose monitor, a glucometer. Hey, so that's it. That's everything that you need to know for Chapter 14, Medical Emergencies. Until next time, be good people, do good things, and I'll see you all later.